Hey everybody, welcome to Microgrest. I'm so, I'm so excited. I'm so happy you're here. Uh, so tonight is somebody, we've been Twitter friends for like a while now. Yeah, definitely. Good. Mr. Frank McCormick. How you doing, dude? Good. I, uh, as I told you, I'm in uh, our new office space. If people wonder why it looks like uh, I'm in a dentist office, because it could very well have been a dentist office, but there's nothing set up, but, uh, you know, tacky, tacky wall art to the left of me. Yeah, I'm, I'm used to seeing your sort of like ornate house or whatever it is in most of your <laughs> interviews. I was like, what the hell? Horrible redecorating. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. I've got like, you know, a cool kind of color lamp back there, but that's about it. Uh, <laughs> no, it's going to be great. It'll be a work in progress. <laughs> uh, I should say for anyone watching this i finally it finally it finally got me i had the covid so uh if i'm a little bit brain dead tonight i'm still like a bit loopy and i didn't shave off my uh covid half beard was it was it that bad like were you like pretty sick or it's I, it's weird because it's like simultaneously it sucks and is also not a big deal at all you know i like when like my like especially like you know, former colleagues, teachers, like when they get COVID, they like post like, you know, like I have it. And they're like post pictures of like medicine and like masks and like make, you know, the whole theatrics of it. Like, yeah, you know, I need, oh, they won't say thoughts and prayers. They're like, I need healing energy sent my way. Oh, you know, I, what? Okay. But that's something we need to talk about is this sort of like therapy language that has just taken over right. every facet of culture that I find it insufferable. Um, real quick, before we begin, let me say to, hi to all our lovers here. Hey, Leah. Hey, Giorgio. Hey, Hope. Hey, Caleb. Yeah, uh, Caleb is already shading me for my... I'm, I'm the only Italian who has the body hair of, like, one of those cat, those scary-ass cats. <laughs> That's terrible. But I decided, hey, Tina, um, we have super chats if anyone feels like uh, contributing to the Mike Getting Out of New York Fund. Um, oh yeah, my point though, in saying that, oh yeah, so COVID, my point in that was I'm a little bit, that's sort of one of the annoying things that, uh, sticks with you is being brain dead. So if I lose my train of thought or something, I promise I'm not smoking crack <laughs> only a little bit. How are you, Frank though? What have you been up to lately? I'm good. You know, just starting this kind of new, uh, parent-based organization locally in town. So like we got, you know, funded and we're kind of launching a uh, campaign against our school district um, and doing a lot. It's kind of like a testing ground. You know, we, we've got kind of like the funds to um, try a lot of different things. Like we just sent out about like 18,000 mailers because, you know, the school's performance has been declining uh, for probably about since 2012. And you know, we've been sending out like emails like once or twice a week to a big mailing list to everyone in town. So I've been kind of busy doing that. Um, you know, it's been uh, it's been interesting. And, uh, you know, the school district's finally starting to respond. They they were kind of like ignoring us at first. And then, you know, every town got hit, every home got hit with this mailer, um, you know, like those political ones you normally get. But this was on the school district. And all of a sudden they're like freaking out now. We're like, oh. Should have responded to us earlier. Shouldn't have canceled a superintendent, like canceled a meeting he had with me, like less than 24 hours. We had it scheduled for a month and he like schedules, like cancels the night before through a secretary. No word to me, no reschedule. So I'm like, fine. Why was that just because you're an inconvenient person? Yeah, I guess he just, you know, decided he had better things to do or he was making a point. I think he was probably trying to make a point. So then I was like, fine, send out the mailers now. And we like within four days, send them all out. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, okay. So wait, before we like jump ahead, let's like for people who this may be their first time seeing you, Frank is awesome. You do so much amazing stuff, but sort of let's imagine that this is the part in the movie where we freeze frame and we're like, how did you get here? How did you get here? Frank McCormick. Man, um, a lot of drugs. <laughs> You know, okay, so I'm trying to think how to start it. Um, I, I guess the analogy I used to be like, what did you do? Like, so just be like, so tell us what you did. Like, you know, it's kind of, if you think like you're, you're a teacher and you're like, 
he kind of asked himself, I wonder what would happen if I just started doing the opposite of everything they like asked you to do and everything they expected you to say. And so this is like the summer of 2021. And a lot of people are talking about like critical race theory and what's going on in education. And there's, you know, the same type of stuff that went around uh, school districts across the country, you know, the diversity, equity, and inclusion departments forming the kind of ideological um, agendas being embedded in curriculum. We start to have that in my school district. So I just like, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to see what happens. I'm going I'm to make a Twitter account. I'll call it Chalkboard Heresy. I'll be anonymous at first. That lasted about two weeks till I like wanted to like, you know, I'm like, yeah, we'll just put my name out there. Uh, how did they find you out? How did what? They, how did they find you out? Well, I don't know exactly. Um, I think once my name was attached to it, it was just someone must have stumbled across it. Um, and they started emailing my school district like, do you know you have a teacher out there saying this, saying, you know, whatever I was saying at the time. You know, I, and at the time I was being kind of like really kind of mild mannered, being like, yeah, these are the problems I'm seeing in our schools. Um, and they started responding like first, not sure. First, actually, the first thing they wanted to do was they wanted to do a, a mental wellness check on me because they like thought, you know, I must've been crazy. Like, I, and maybe you have to be to kind of like expose the stuff. And, and I still kind of took it easy. There got to a certain point though. This was like in the fall, I was just tweeting about like, you know, critical race theory. And I, I found like documents telling like administrators to read up on critical race theory in school emails. So I was kind of, you know, like, Hey, everyone is saying that it's not in school districts. And like, here it is in my school district. It's, it's, be, they're being instructed to like study up on it and read on it. And I realized there was a point, like, I'm like, okay, like I'm going to lose my job. I don't know when, I don't know how, but it's going to happen one way or the other. They'll either fire me outright or they'll go through like the evaluation process. So I realized I had like this kind of narrow window to like expose as much as I could. And I'm, and then I was kind of like, you know, I might have fun with it too. And just like, you know, again, like I said, do the opposite of everything that they would expect you to do. And it created a lot of chaos because they just had no idea how to respond. You know, uh, I would they would issue a statement on like Columbus day. And I'd like post on Twitter, like, Hey, my district said this, I think Columbus day is great. And we should celebrate it. And like, you know, and they well, would, well, I was going to say, what were like sort of the specific things that they had problems with was really just those things like, cause that was sort of for me with my sort of journey away from the left was all of those ridiculous little things that pile up first. It's just the pronouns then it's this. And then those little things become big things. It's funny because it was always very nebulous and they could never really point like, and I think that was strategic on their part. They didn't want to get like some type of legal battle where they were picking, but it was always like insinuation, like he's posting white supremacist, you know, ideas, he's racist, he's transphobic. And I'd be like, what, what specifically do you have a problem with? And they could never tell me, never. no one could ever say, um, so it was just kind of like these insinuations and that's all it takes. It takes just like some accusations and like throwing it out there. And then people are just kind of like, Oh, you know, they're repeating it. And and then I talk to people in the community and they'd be like, I'd be like, look at my stuff, read, you know, tell me what you have a problem with. And they're like, wait, I thought you were like a, like posting racist stuff on there. And I'm like, no, you know, and it was a majority like Hispanic and black town. And I was like, I'm like, yeah, I, I told you. So I was able to kind of like, turn some people too and kind of, you know, red pill some people in the community that weren't um, kind of aware of what was going on. And um, it got to the point eventually where, you know, at the end, I was just like, I was on like a sinking ship. So uh, went to a school board meeting and like just lit up the superintendent for two minutes and then resigned after that. Um, because, you know, I, I having a wife and child, I was kind of like, it was like one well, being at like a Western movie where you're like on a burning train. <laughs> And it's going like across, like to, like the bridge where it just falls out. And I was like, yeah, I got to jump at some point because I got a wife and kid and, um, you know, was able to like get some contract work and do some of that temporarily. But it so was, were you uh, like was really a, a teacher then or had you been teaching for a long time? No, I've been teaching for about 10 or 11 years. Um, oh, yeah. 
so yeah, I think it I think it was a lot like it had built up over a decade of being quiet of playing the game and you kind of like or at least for me I reached a point where I just couldn't do it anymore and it, it was like a pressure valve I just snapped and um you know I was talking about that with Paul Rossi recently who kind of did the same thing exposed and I think you know, for those of us that do do it, there's always that similar description. People feel like I did it until I couldn't do it anymore. And it was just like, a, you know, just popped. So what would you say that it was sort of the situation changed? They changed, you changed? Like, did you, have you sort of always had the same beliefs or did you come from the left side of things? I, I came in very much from the left and over the years, um, probably about halfway really start, you know, I, I'm in this system that, you know, is a a classic example example of like the failure of of leftist policies and leftist kind of you know public bureaucracy, and so going into teaching, having these kind of romantic fantasies about like what public service was and what like a school could be. And just seeing like, you're expecting dead poet society. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it was just failure after failure after failure, incompetence. I mean, it was just so ingrained in the system. And then, you know, I reached kind of like a low point. Like, you know, I then I I just it becomes about survival. People are like, well, just hang in there for another 30 years and then you'll get your retirement. And like, yeah, the like the retirement package was awesome. It was, you know, it's probably worth like six million dollars when you get to like 55 what? years old. Yep. I thought teachers yeah. made nothing. They do make well. That's Until not really thirty true. years from now, so it takes you. So you make nothing for thirty years, and then thirty in thirty years you make everything. Yeah, I mean, look, if you ca- I, I've done a lot of the math. Like, yeah, uh, if you calculate in Illinois the pension value that's at the back end, teachers make more than doctors. If you calculate, if you if you layer that in. Because it, it ends up being something like uh, it adds like 112000 a year on top of what they're making. And you have to take you have to remember that teachers who like even at my school district, was which was considered very low paying, you had teachers making like 65, 75 K a year. And that was for nine months of work. It was for seven hours of like on the clock time a day. And I know teachers always tell you like, oh, we work 13, 14. We work we work 50 hours a day. I know that's not possible, but we somehow do it. Um, No, they don't. They leave at the same time the kids leave. And, you know, they maybe do a little prep, but it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of dishonesty. And so you get that like, you know, nine months work, nine months out of the year, seven hours a day. And then only of that seven hours, only like two and a half is actually teaching. You know, there's prep, there's lunch, there's a lot of useless meetings, but uh, it's over exaggerated a lot. So when you really calculate in like the amount of work teachers have to do, um, the time they have off, and that pension plus plus the benefits. I mean, you don't pay for your health insurance, you don't pay for your life insurance, uh, and it's pretty generous too. Really great health insurance. You know, the only the 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 biggest negative is is actually having to like deal with the system. But if you can find a way to like you know be happy and make it work and some te- some are some people are uh, most I don't people, think people are like us could ever do that <laughs> they're just you know like they just kind of like make peace with it come in you know so wait, were you in were you in chicago the whole time so i was in a city called waukegan it was about 45 minutes north of chicago it's it's an you know what, what teachers like to call an urban school district which basically means you know a broke black and hispanic city yeah, uh, it's it was very classic, kind of like you know when you think of like an inner city school. That's what Waukegan High School was. You were the Michelle Pfeiffer. I was the Michelle Pfeiffer. I like to think of like Tom Berenger. I just post about that, like the substitute. I, I, I for the longest time thought I made that movie up in my head when I was like five. <laughs> the substitute, because <laughs> well, it's the only movie where he like kills students. He's like ex special forces, right. and there's like gangbanger students, and he like strangles them at the end, like. You know, fighting the fight the principal too. The principal's like a drug lord, and they have like a gun battle in the school. Could never be made. I think when I was a kid, I saw that 
part of that and part of this movie, the, the Dentist on Late Night Cable one night, and I thought they were the same movie forever. So this whole time I thought it was like an evil teacher who's also an evil dentist. <laughs> I don't know, it made sense in my head. Um, by the way, parentheses, let me uh, hit up some of our chats. Thank you so much, Sun Sunspot, for the super chat. Teacher here, students really don't like CRT. That is a giant white pill. Do you, do you, have you found that to be true, Frank? I'm you know, hoping. I don't know if it's that. I I don't know. I don't know if it's a matter of like or dislike. What I found that the problem was is um, a lot of the the ideology that gets kind of transmitted to students, they very readily absorb and incorporate it. It probably does make them unhappier in the long run, but it's very effective. Uh, students, you know, I started noticing a change after like 2016 when the classroom got even more political and, and my students would come to me and they'd be like parroting ideas that they had no idea. Like, don't you have white privilege? I'm like, well, what's white privilege mean? They couldn't tell me, you know, like, well, it, it means, I mean, I actually had a student go, you can like murder someone and get away with it. Basically. I'm like, really? Like that's what white, like, where did you hear this? They're like, well, English class. I'm like, what, what the hell's going on in English class? It's, it's so funny how these, these talking points sort of are all encompassing because they are in the classroom. They're in entertainment. They're in the media. Cause uh, that just made me think of, I, I apparently love torturing myself. So I was watching the woke Velma show and that's a talking point that they have in it, that white people, I thought there's a line where she's like, if I were white, I would murder people. So I'd get away with it. I'm like, when, yeah, when does that even happen? Like, yeah, the most famous per example of someone getting away with murder, totally, you know, white like OJ. Right. I know. It's it's hilarious. I mean, they can never, again, never, there's never specifics. It's generalities. And I, I spent, you know, um, years arguing with teachers about this. And you'd ask for, you, you could present certain, I mean, look, I'll be honest with you. Teachers are not necessarily the brightest of people. I know they're supposed to be, but they're just not. Like the profession does not attract, um, as a whole, you get some really smart people, but you get a whole lot of people that are just like, hey, this is a job where I can't get fired. There's actually kind of a low barrier to entry. Um, and that barrier to entry is not so much grade based or like, it's more like, you know, can you go through these like, you know, uh, uh, loops and, you know, uh, regulations and state tests to become a teacher. I mean, you can be a C college student if you just have the patience to go through it all. You can, you can do it. So, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I was not very impressed with like my profession as a whole when I was teaching. And um, I, w I wasn't impressed with these people when I was in school. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't like people, you know, it's become kind of a the conservatives become afraid now to like, they're like, I'm not anti teacher. I don't want to, you know, bad mouth teachers or say this, but like, I kind of feel like I can, as a teacher, validate some of that and be like some of the worst incompetence, some of the, the most terrible things happening um, in the profession uh, came from teachers and administrators. I mean, they're almost, they're like teachers who couldn't teach, who ascend the public bureaucracy. So they're even worse in my opinion, but I've worked a lot of different jobs. I've never seen some of the things uh, that I've seen out of employees uh, as I have from teachers. It's, it's just crazy. I mean, look at like Chicago, like the sex abuse uh, stuff that was going on there. Uh, 700 um, cases of like sexual abuse in one year from Chicago public schools. That's, you know, yeah, it's a big school district, but it's. Yeah, I, th I think it's sort of the combination of wherever you have authority, the meeting of authority figures, which people worship, and these sort of different professions that are deified, like teachers or church, all the sex abuse that's happened there, people are willing to go along with anything. And so it gets covered up and a lot of people have no problem with that. Yeah. And, and it is one of the, like, there's a joke like, oh, you know, teachers can't get fired, but it is really, really, really hard to get fired as a teacher. You know, the only the, the easiest way to get fired as a teacher is to start being like either openly conservative or, you know, contradict kind of like the ideological narrative. But outside of that, the stuff you can do, I mean, you know, we had teachers that just like didn't teach. Like they just didn't teach. They just came into class, hung out, brought donuts for the students. Or or now they just make it their own personal therapy session, apparently.
Yeah, and and I think there's a reason for that. Yeah, it's because it gives them validation. For for people who don't know, I meant to ask, uh, what grade were you, uh, high school? Yeah, I was uh, high school uh, social studies. I'm a a history and education major, um, but they threw every, you know, I taught econ. They don't want that. Yeah, yeah. It was, they, don't, uh, they don't want proper history being taught. They don't. They don't let, you know, it's funny because the, a lot of the people behind like the ideological stuff, they're not history majors. They don't understand like the discipline of history or how to teach it properly. Um, you know, they're like political science or not that there's anything wrong with political science, but you have people that, you know, they, they were put in charge of teaching history classes or writing history curriculums and they just you know, and fill it with whatever they want. English teachers are the worst. They are the the worst offenders. Um, people think so. Like these nutty broads too. Right, right. It's the it's like the 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 45, 50 year old woman who just got divorced and like went back to teaching and she's like <laughs> it was like that or like yoga instructor and she like wants to like relate with these kids. And they always have like inappropriate like questionable relationships with like what some of their junior like you know male students you know you're like eh, like you're a little too comfortable talking to them about certain things and like you know the hugs you give them like it's a stereotype but like you know it was english teachers it was they were uh, a big problem with you know and then the therapy stuff like i mean we had i had some english teachers i used to joke before this was even a thing i was like what is going on in literature class? I'd ask my students this. They're telling me like, what are you doing? And I'm like, is it like therapy there? Or are you actually learning how to read or write? And a lot of it was like therapy. That's what the entire culture is being uh, wrapped around as this sort of therapy culture where it's just all about, even like the language they use, they're, they're holding space and it's just, I can't take it. It's, it's drugstore psychology. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's crazy. Um, I, I remember there's this one English teacher and I used to joke like, you know, with some of my colleagues, I'm like, so, so what does her class look like? I mean, it's like the students come in, she asks them like a sad journal prompt because she knows, you know, how these kids grow up. She's going to like milk them for everything they're worth. Like, tell me about a time an adult disappointed you. And they'd be like, oh, my dad left me when I was three years old. And then they'd be like, like, bring it to like our meeting. And they're like, these kids are opening up to me. It's like, yeah, because you like told them to. And then, then they kind of like, you know, have to get really involved in their personal lives and they're going to fix these kids. I mean, it's just gross. It's Um, it's exploitative. I want to, I want to hit up some of the chat for a second. And then I want to talk about the origin of this stuff. But, um, Hi, Sarah. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to real quick say uh, one of our beautiful friends of the channel, John, I'm so sorry. He uh, lost his grandfather recently. I'm so sorry, John. I hope you are doing okay. And we love you and we're all praying for you. And I hope your family's all right. Um, So we're all thinking about you, buddy. Um, Sorry, I said to say that. Um, Tina, teachers are paid to indoctrinate as they were indoctrinated for the most part. Um, well, what I wanted to ask you is when do you think this sort of started to, cause I remember back a million years ago in the stone age, when I was in high school, you could see the, it's starting even back then. And I think about some of the things that happened when I was in high school in terms of the indoctrination. And I'm thinking if that's how it was, then I can't imagine how it must be now. Yeah, I mean, it's... Like high school I've, I've in Manhattan, public school, they literally had communism club they would we i remember we had one homework assignment from the history teacher by the way the history teacher who was a gay guy and they never told us this part we had a homework assignment write an essay about why che guevara is your hero and the gay history teacher left out the part where he beheaded gay people Literally, yeah. they literally took he uh, took the entire class. My parents were smart, so they didn't let me go. But he took the class illegally on a trip to Cuba, so everyone can learn how to be socialists. What? That's crazy. I mean, it doesn't surprise me, but it's still crazy to hear that. And that was like hundred years ago. Yeah. I, okay. So I this was my big problem with um, when I started like looking at like internally and, and, and releasing some of the, like the teachers in my district's lesson plans, they, they, they always presupposed the answer they were trying to get students to. So it was never like, 
is systemic racism a problem in America? It was how is systemic racism? So, so I would tell them, I'd say, hey, they'd say, what, what's your problem with this? I'd say, you have decided for the students already. You, you've started with systemic racism is real. It exists. It's a problem. And then you're basically telling students, now prove, prove my point. You know, prove I'm correct. One teacher, okay, so this is what, what, what gets me too, is that they always accuse it like, you know, DeSantis is trying to get rid of black studies and African-American history. And I and I'm thinking like, OK, that may be true, but he wouldn't have to do that if black history wasn't a Trojan horse to insert all this ideological garbage. For example, my high school, our first black history class, if you looked at the lesson plans, it was like social justice 101. I mean, there were lesson plans day to day. How how are police? How is policing today related to slavery or slave patrols? You know, um, how did Michael Brown um, influence the new civil rights movement? I mean, that type of shit was going on. And so they're like, oh, you're against black history. I'm like, I'm against whatever. You, if you call that black history and that's what black history has become, because that's not the black history like I remember growing up with, then I'm against whatever that is. But and, and, oh, I'm sorry. They hide behind it. Yeah, no, no, no. They, they, they hide behind it. Like they put it up as like a, as a shield, as a mask or they they cloak the ideological agenda in black history and women's studies and whatever they want. So when you attack it, they're like, why are you against black history? Why are you against women's studies? Why are you against it? You know, and they sound great on the surface. It's very effective. It's very clever. And um, yeah, that's what they do with all of it. So that if you disagree with any of their, you know, but, and I think, and I, I really feel like all of these different things are so interconnected you know like just everything we went through the last couple of years with covid you could draw a line from that to so many different things that happened before it with uh the medicalization of kids with the gender ideology and before that how many people are being put on antidepressants and pharmaceutical drugs and these things and i feel like we this is where i feel like i blame the right more than anything because they let things go and let things go and let things go and then these things are just being taught to little kids as if they're facts that they're now being told there are 97 genders. They're being told, like you mentioned, Michael Brown, that's now gospel truth when it never even right. happened, as they claim. Exactly. Um, the right, I think, is very prone to the, the, the right has, you know, classic ADHD, which I have. So they're very much like, oh, look at this. Issue. Oh, that issue. I mean, so, um, you know. The, the CRT, the, the racial ideologies, has not gone away from, we're not talking about it anymore. It's now kind of become ingrained in the school system. For good reasons, we've become focused on like some of the, the weird, you know, the trans ideology going on and, and because they've really like gone full heavy uh, into that this year. But I remind people like, guys, don't, don't lose focus of like the other stuff because it's still there. And it just becomes kind of ingrained. We forget about it. Next year, it's going to be something else. I don't even want to imagine what it's going to be. I mean, <laughs> but always say that we've forgotten about this. I, I think the gender stuff is just sort of the perfect entry point into an entire cult. Like they've yeah, just found I mean, the perfect way. It, it has a foot in everything that they need to completely control people, alter their minds, alter their bodies, make them a lifelong medical patient. It's, it's so, if you had told me, so I'm thinking back to 2021, I'm like, you know, so yeah, like, hey, here's CRT in, in my school district. Here's like kind of, look, they're bringing in Ibram Candy. And I'm like, that's outrageous. And you had told me like, hey, in a year, like, you know, you all forgot about this. There'll be like drag queens, like dancing in schools and reading to kids. I would be like, I, I don't, it's just like, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have said that is like so hyperbolic. Like even for me, that's just too crazy to believe. But I don't know. I, I guess like we are in this weird multiverse where like every what if becomes our reality. So like whatever what if like, you know, someone says to me like, hey, next year they're going to be doing use your imagination. I, or it's probably the, the scary thing is it's what you can't imagine. You know, that's what it's going to be. It's like something that you can't imagine. It's going to be so bizarre. It's going to be so out of perception. But it, it very it quickly is. becomes. It is yeah. now. Double mastectomies to twelve-year-old girls. I know, and everyone will be okay with that, and politicians will be campaigning on it. 
and this isn't something like that. I just like, it's not like that, like, Hey, there's a few uh, instances of this. And I just get like focused on them. My former school district where I taught had a drag queen parade on Cinco de Mayo. They were strutting around and it was a middle school, a middle school. Well, I mean, it was, it was not. And I think what makes this such a particularly difficult problem is it can't really be legislated away. It can, you know, obviously I support anything to help it along, especially in terms of surgeries and minimum ages and stuff. Um, but in terms of like the drag queen story time and stuff, it's these parents who are bringing them there. I'm sure you guys all saw this video the other day of this, like this drag queen with his his little micro penis hanging out and flopping around and there's this little kid in the background yeah was the, the kid is the smartest one in the friggin' room the only one with any common sense like anyone would be having the same reaction we all would be and there's his friggin' nutty broad of a mother behind him oh yay how exotic with her stupid fucking luxury beliefs his mom probably took him home that night and it's like, it was really problematic the way you covered your eyes. Like, we need to process this and work this out. Read him some, like, those books at Target. They now have a diversity, equity, and inclusion section in the children's section that, you know, all these, like, white suburban moms go and buy these books and, like, read to their kids every night. It's a cult. And this is part of a bigger cultural uh, revolution that's going on and people just don't realize it. It's what's scary is, this is not necessarily like, this is not a top-down conspiracy. This is happening very organically the way religious movements do. It's just become part of, to go back to a question you had, you're like, when did this start? I think it's been going on for a while, but the difference is schools at least maintained for a long time. Like, hey, we're going to try and be neutral. And a principal would at least be like, I kind of agree with that, but like, we got to kind of look fair. 2020, George Floyd, then DEI became the orthodoxy of school districts. They were not going to hide behind it, you know, hide it anymore. They were like, okay, this is, a, this is now the religion of the state. And we are going to explicitly instruct our staff and our students in it. That is without a doubt when things changed. And it happened very rapidly. Um, my school district, I mean, I, that was like what really set me off was 2020. Because it was about, tw it took me about 12 months before I'm like, I got to blow this whole shit up. Um, they went and they started taking Dr. Seuss books out of the library, uh, out of the school libraries. And I asked, I sent a letter, like, you know, this is before I'm like, you know, putting my name out or anything. I'm like, hey, you know, just as a teacher here, like, why are you doing this? She's like, to make space for more inclusive books. Make space. Fucking make, make space. space. We got to make space to put pornographic blowjob books in there, which is what they did. I mean, they literally made space and put like the worst books imaginable in there. <laughs> Which, by the way, I love the exam that uh, the excuse for all of this is, oh, we have to teach the kids about gay sex. Yeah, that's really what gay people need more of, sex. That's the <laughs> one thing gay people haven't figured out and are just really lacking for having all the sex. Maybe teach them a little less about it. It's so contradictory, too, to like the, the gay acceptance movement I grew up with, where it was very much like, hey... Like, we got to, like, let people know that, like, most gay people are not, like, you know, riding around, like, with, like, you know, leather bikinis on, like, waving their, like, tits at kids. And then, at some point, they were, like, someone in that movement was like, hey, you know what? We need to do this, and we need to, like, do it in front of kids, and we need to, like, let the public know that that's what we're about. I'm like, what the hell is going on? I've got, like, gay family members that are, like, just you know, outrage about they're like, you know, I was trying to present myself as like the suit and tie gay person who has a husband and we're just like living normal lives. And we are, you know, for the most part, except, you know, you know, we're, we're gay. And then this shit's going on. And it's like set the gay rights movement back decades. Or setting I mean, everyone back. And that and that's where I think I agree with you that it's happening organically. But I think there also is an inorganic element of it also that it feels very yeah. plotted out. Pit every group against every group because it's it's, it, you know, pitting black against white, gay against straight, transgender against everyone. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. I think there are definitely like bad actors that like, um, you know, in certain institutions and in certain levels of society 
Um, kind of like what, you know, you look at like the Chinese Cultural Revolution, it was very much provoked. It's like starting a fire, though. Like all you have to do is kind of you, you build the brush in society and you kind of strategically light little sparks and it and it just goes ablaze. And um, I don't know what scares me. more. Like, I don't know. I used to be like, oh, uh, you know, we're going to go the way of like other societies that embraced, you know, leftism and end up with like, you know, in a few decades, some like totalitarian leftist state. I'm not so sure anymore. I, I'm kind of like equally worried that we're going to have like a counter blow that's going to take us to like right wing authority, authoritarianism, fascism. What happened in the Weimar Republic, which someone asked a uh, question about that because I, you know, spent time studying that in college, which is that's where. Was, let, me, the, let me bring that up. I was waiting. Yeah, to, let's bring that up. That's, that's a great thing to say. I just love saying his name. Send us all your super chats, by the way. Proceeds go to the Mike Getting the Fuck Out of New York Foundation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm supposed to read the super chat. I told you. I'm Giorgio Quattro. That's a great name. Giorgio. I don't even know. You're Italian. Giorgio you, you... Quattrocento. Giorgio uh, Quattrocento. Quattrocento. Uh, Frank, on Twitter, I recall you said you specialized in. Okay. I don't want to butcher German. So you read the German word. Weimar. Weimar. The Germans, man, they, they're very efficient at, uh, at everything they do, including murder. Um, no, so, so you had, uh, you had, if you look at like what was going on in the Weimar Republic, it was an ultra liberal uh, democracy. And it was like too much, too fast for kind of German traditionalism. And they had, like, there's stuff that was like, you know, like, they had, like, transvestite shows in Berlin. It was considered, like, very progressive, very new age. Happened so fast and so rapidly that it provoked, uh, it, coupled with, like, the economic issues that were going on, the loss of World War One, that it just broke German society. And the, the reaction to it, the reaction to Weimar culture, Weimar politics, to the economy, was the National Socialist Party, which started off with like 50 members and ended up seizing control of the country. So that's something else a lot of people don't, you know, I've even talked to like friends I have on the left. I'm like, do you realize this could really turn out badly for you? Like you keep provoking, like you keep being like, ha ha, like you stupid, like, you know, conservatives, blah, blah, we're going to, we're going to bring more trans people, you know, to dance in front of your kids at school. I'm like, you push people far enough, you bring in an economic crisis what you, you open that bo Pandora's box, you have no idea what you're unleashing in a country with what, like how many millions, how many hundreds of millions of guns do we have? Like it could be bad. It could be really bad. See, uh, I, maybe that's prefer, what I feel like I prefer your idea of that than mine. Mine is just because I maybe it's being in New York throughout all this, but like, I've just been so disillusioned with there being, the slightest of pushback against this thing. I mean, here it, at least it's the, and I think not just here, uh, it, people were just all too willing to bend over for anything they said. Yeah. Yeah. You never know which way it's going to go. And, and like when you talk to people about it, like people increasingly um, like during 2020, like you heard a lot of people like, you know what, whatever brings order to our streets at this point, I don't care. You can very quickly get to a breaking point where people are scared if things are looking really dire, they will very quickly turn to kind of the uh, authoritarian response. And, and it's hard to blame people because it's like safety, security, and order, which is like your most basic kind of, you know, you talk about real psychology, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You most at a basic level, you want to feel secure, you want to feel safe. And the left constantly threatens that, which is why sometimes, you know, fascism can be so effective is because um, it appeals to like your most basic response. So, you know, who knows? It's it's just like, it's like trying to look in a crystal ball, which either way, it's not good. Um, but I more and more increasingly, I, I can easily see how you could, you know, go the go the opposite way. But um, but a lot of people like I, I mean, I have like friends and stuff I talk to. And uh, this is what kind of makes me think that like, we could go down this direction. They're kind of like, hey, you know, just between you and me, like, if that did happen, I you know, I'm not complaining. I'm like, okay, so this is how people are thinking already. And you, things get worse. You bring in like a currency crisis into the mix. Like, you know, our, our debts come due at some point or, uh, and the, the currency rapidly loses value faster than it is hyperinflation, you know, See, um, 
Imagine we've seen, that. We've seen, yeah, yeah. Historically, we've seen how quickly things can go from like good to like terrible. And so it doesn't take much imagination to like stretch it a little bit more. It's, it's just so depressing. I feel like, uh, you know, I think something important to note is that there are no small things with this. I feel like so many people, like I said, just let everything go. Like just uh, an example of it, the masks with COVID, that was the gateway to the whole thing, the mandates, everything. And people just, nobody wanted to say anything. They let the left always define the terms of engagement, define the rules for how we can live our lives. And then they go along with it and they don't want to rock the boat and they don't want to make a fuss. Yeah. I, I have like the same where I, where it's like the, the left wins this war one inch at a time. They get you to move like an inch. It's like, okay, I'll be, well, you know, is it really that unreasonable to ask this, to ask that and all of a sudden, you know, you're like 300 feet back in enemy territory and you know, you ask, how did we get here? It's like, well, you got here like one little concession at a time because people didn't want to take a stand. They're always waiting for the big thing to take a stand on, but it's never, it's rarely a big thing. It's usually little tiny things that happen incrementally and people acquiesce to them until. It's just you know, a pronoun. It's just a mask. It's, it's a just, pronoun, just a mask. It's just, yeah. uh, you know, that's how they got away. That's how they moved the line so much with uh, all of the censorship on social media. It's just Alex Jones. It's just this person, just that person. Yep. And it's anyone. It's everyone. I give a sensitive content label on my account. You know why? You For sharing pictures of the book Gender Queer. No. Yes. Yes. Which you can go back. Schools for little kids, so it's, it's like school. the kids can read it, but you can't share it on Twitter. My account is in the same category as p Twitter porn because I was sharing books that are in U.S. schools. I, I, I couldn't make this up. It's insane. I uh, I should have mentioned this before, but yeah, Frank is one of the most suppressed people on Twitter. You, Billboard Chris. Yep. Uh, Brandon Strzok is very suppressed also. Yeah. I think the three of you are sort of the most shadow banned. Mine you can see what happens. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed too, though, that yours, you can notice like at some point it catches on. Like I noticed it would, it would kind of wax and wane, but I would get like 150 new followers a day. And, and a bad day, it would be like 70. And that was just like average. It was just like, wow, like this is kind of cool. And all of a sudden, it just, you know, the sensitive content filter goes on and it just flatlines. And you can make a tweet and you're like, it gets like out to like 3% of people are following you. And like, how does that happen? Oh, um, and that views counter that they added just makes it so much worse. <laughs> they, no, it really stings. You're like looking at views and seven likes. And then you'll see someone else too. And they'll be like, you know, like my cat just looked at me that way. And they'll be like, you know, skyrocketing like in views. And you're like, okay, something is really going off. Billboard Chris too. I mean, he should be in the hundreds of thousands of followers because of what he's doing. Millions. And like the profile he has, he should, he should be like, yeah, he should be close to like a million by now. And they're making, you know, so I'm, I'm waiting. I, I'm not, I don't know how hopeful I am. You know, Elon Musk keeps like going on Twitter. He's like, this is outrageous what they're doing. I'm like, Dude, you, it's like, you don't even awesome. acknowledge anything about the shadow banning. Yeah, he's he hasn't like talked about it much. Like he'll he's like, you know, Veritas. I'm like, look at these, the Twitter leaks and files. But I'm kind of looking at him like, what are, what are you waiting for? Like, like, yeah, I get it. You're telling the wrong people, dude. Like you are the chief now. Like, um, and people have told me that like, well, it's because they can't just rip out the code. It's deeply ingrained. I get that. But then talk about that. Tell us like, this is what's yeah. happening. This is what's coming. Um, it's I'm, I'm just glad to be on there. So I, I, I feel like I have my title as like one of the most banned people. I was banned from there four times. And this, this four account, times? I only made four times on one account. And then I just, I, they, the last one, they just got me on. So I so I was, I wasn't on Twitter the whole time that I was like, going to the White House and traveling all in 2020. So I just made this one like maybe a year ago. Yeah, I mean, ultimately I've told people it's good to have, like I know like Facebook is kind of considered like, you know, eh, no one uses it as much, but I've actually like gotten, my engagement on Facebook is so much better. And like, I don't know, like I think it's good to have a backup. You, If you put all your stock in Twitter, 
you know, they can just like that erase you and then you, you have no one to communicate with, or you can get back into like certain channels. It's just hard, but you know, to compare, I have like 17,000 people that follow me on Facebook and I'll post something and the engagement, like I have something that got like, you know, 400,000 views in like 48 hours. And I'm like, okay, so this is what like real engagement looks like. And Twitter does do like, I got, you know, sometimes the thing, I mean, I'm sorry, Facebook does do censorship, but they're actually more transparent about it. Like they'll be like, we have put this restriction on your account for 30 days and you're going to get decreased visibility. They'll tell you about it. Twitter won't. And that to me, at least is something like, I'm like, okay, at least Facebook is being like somewhat transparent about it. Uh, whereas with uh, Twitter, it's just like, They'll, they'll lie to you about it. I mean, they'll just, you kind of. Oh, yeah. They, that's, what, that's what they banned me for. They just made up reasons. It was like uh, evading a suspension when I never had one or uh, m managing multiple accounts when I never had multiple accounts. So the, it, they'll find a reason or they'll make one up. Sure. Facebook hates me, though. I got suspended from Facebook for a month for saying the title of the movie, Halloween Kills. <laughs> Those threats what? of violence. Oh, my. I'm like, did, I feel like they, certain people they don't they don't like. Did you appeal it? Like, did you get someone to look at it? Yeah, they, the, those appeals they only use that for if they've run out of toilet paper. <laughs> um, but I want to I want to uh, get to uh, our beloved poetry painter uh, Frank. People seem to have discovered this madness due to COVID and Zoom education. How long has it really been going on? That's a good question. Um, it's probably okay. So like, maybe if you had to like, talk about like, you know, let's, let's like use like the oven analogy. You got like, it's at like low medium heat for like, you know, since 2000, maybe, uh, 2016 Donald Trump goes up to like medium, medium high. They're like, really getting, they're like, we have to do something. Our students are the future. We can't let Donald Trump happen again. So we got to be really explicit in like in our political instruction. But districts are still like, eh, you know, we're going to we're going to take a neutral position. We, you know, he's still the president. We don't want to get too political. Then 2020, it's like, you know, they turned it up to high. They broke the knob off and they, you know, here we are. And that's going back to what I was saying. What pisses me off is I feel like so many people just allowed that to happen. They did because no one wanted to be during like that George Floyd moment, like called a racist. Like people like, like now people are like, yeah, I'll question it. It's like, dude, okay, that's great. Do that in uh, June of 2020, July of 2020. Like go, like be, be the voice of like, I mean, I got like, I, I was a, just, you know, just a teacher back then. And I, I remember I would like say some things on like Facebook and people were like, I'm like telling your like, you know, boss, they like email my, I got emails to my school district. Like I, I want him like gone from the school because he said the rioters were dangerous and like, I want him fired or I will like blow this up. And at the time, you know, I was like, like, oh crap, like I'm going to lose my job. Like I'm trying to, you know, like when you lose your job in teaching, it's, you know, other schools are like, how the hell did he get fired from teaching? Like, you know, they won't hire you. So but then I got to a point where I was like, I can't do this anymore a year later. But it was it was really risky in 2020. And the problem is, is when we need people to be risky, they're never they're never willing to take that risk. And they, they jump on the train like now. But there's going to be something next year, for example. And when we I'm need people, they're not going to be there. Like, I know that right, right now they say they are, but but I guarantee you that most of them won't. And that's the problem we, we get into. And I'm not saying like, like, oh, like, you know, I'm, I'm such a great, like that's, I, I've just got something wrong with me. Like there's something wrong with me where like someone says something I have to like go against them. Like I have to be the one person like, eh, like, you know, I'm going to type a comment on Facebook. I'm going to like go ahead and like ruin my career. You know, it'd be like 2016. I'm like, well, maybe Donald Trump isn't Hitler and like a teacher group on Facebook and, you know, get people like just destroying me. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I don't have, I don't know. I, I'm really concerned that, especially with education, you know, as long as they control that kind of, it's the, it's the pipeline through which everyone goes through. Like I look, I know there's like people, there's like homeschooling's never been higher, but let's be honest. Like the vast majority of society goes through the public yeah. education pipeline. As long as they control that, they control future demographics. And 
yes, like Republicans, conservatives, like they have to not to education, but not enough people. And like, it's easy to like go on Twitter and be like, yeah, look at how much it's like the focus of conversation. But then you look at it and it's like, okay, like my reach and like the reach of like other people that are really talking about it, like Moms for Liberty, 40,000 people follow them, me, 27. Like, it's not as big as we think. There's kind of a bias there. And an, I don't think enough people have woken up on the education issue and really like understand like how it underlies everything else. And I wish, you know, my problem is just like, again, like now I'm like suppressed and shadow banned. Like I can get in a room with people like, you know, James Lindsay and I, we went to North Dakota and we had like, you know, a room of a hundred people. And we just got them like, they were so fired up. They're like, I'm running for school board. I get this now. Like, it's really easy to get people to see like why you have to focus on education before anything else. But if they're suppressing us on social media, I mean, James Lindsay can like, he's got like 400,000 people, but can you look at his like engagement? It's, it's crazy. It's our super artificially low. They don't want this being discussed because they know it's like their most vital, uh, important weapon. You know, you control the education system. You've got everything, you know, well, and especially that they've started so young, like, um, you know, like I said, going back to when I was in school, there were all the seeds of it more than being planted. But it seems like a newer thing now that they're starting with kids so inordinately young. Yeah, yeah. It used when to I, be college. Remember, it was like, it was college. The teacher opened a white egg, opened a brown egg, and look, we're all the same on the inside. That's nice for kids. Like, right. now it would be like, the white egg's white privilege, and we're going to yeah. crack it against the wall. Right, right. <laughs> bitch. No, no, no. What you'd have is you'd have, like, the brown egg, and they take, like, a white egg, and they, like, place it on top of the brown egg and crack it. Like, be like, oh, like, look what they did. Get your egg off my egg or something like that. And the kids would be like rioting and they'd be like throwing the white eggs at everyone in the hall. No, um, where was I going so that, with this? I, that's the part though that I think is newer is this starting in kindergarten and sorry, anti racist baby and stuff like that. Do you remember? Yeah, exactly. Do you remember in like 2010? I think it was like 29, 28 to 2010 that colleges they start to really focus on like indoctrination and even though i've been going on forever you had like people like ben shapiro like going to college he's like ah, excuse me i want to talk to about all the you know things are going on and everyone like woke up they're like yeah colleges left-wing indoctrination look at how quickly it went to kate you know high schools middle schools now kindergarten i mean you know a decade so think about what, you know, we know what like college has like shifted, the ideology being pushed in college has shifted kind of like the political demographic. It's made it harder for conservatives to win elections. How how much longer do we have until like conservatives just can't win, period, because we don't have the numbers? I mean, if they get them from kindergarten, that's what I, again, I keep going back to this point. I like want to drill in people's heads. You care about gun rights. You care about freedom of religion. You care about, it's, okay, great. But you won't have the numbers if you lose the schools. So, like, everything else has to come after the education issue because they're working on them really young. And I know you think, like, you talk to your kids and, like, you know what? So you talk to your kid, like, how, how much, how often do people really talk about politics with their kids? Let's say they do 10 minutes a day. Like, that's what the kids can tolerate. They may have been getting three hours of it in school or even if they get an hour a day. You know, it's an hour a day versus, you know, the parents 10 minutes. You, you don't have a you don't have a, ch a chance with your own kids. It's horrifying. And it, it's uh, like I said, it goes back so far. I think that you, I think messages are being sent to these kids that your role in life is to be a Democrat, is to be a leftist. God, if I, if, I have to tell you the sickest anecdote from when I was in school, like, I, and it didn't even occur to me at the time how horrible this was until years later. And I still think about it sometimes, but I think it was like the first day of high school or something. Um, I'm old, so Bush was president. <laughs> I, I wish I could like, I wish that I could lie and say, I, I don't know, some other person <laughs> and lie about my age. But so anyway, they, they had one of these like ridiculous classroom activities that we're going to go around the room and everyone is going to answer the same question. What do you want in life? So the first girl, they ask, what do you want in life? She's like, 
I want the Bush administration to be taken out of office. Oh, that's so good. Everyone applauds the teacher. Well done. Beautiful. They ask the second person, what do you want in life? I want the Bush administration. Clap, clap, clap. Third person, fourth person, fifth person. Every single person said the exact same answer. And by the time, and it was maybe like 20 kids in the class. So it gets to me. And I'm like, and, and I, to this day, I can't stand Bush or change. Like, that's not my jam at all. But what do I want in life? That's not what I want in life. So, um... So I said, I was like, what do I want to have? I was like, well, I want to have a successful career doing something artistic. You would have thought I pulled my pants down and took a jump <laughs> on the floor. The room just got silent. The teacher did the retracto head. His head, like, I thought it was going to roll off. And so he goes, he's like, hmm, okay. A little selfish, but if you if you feel okay with that. So they go to the next person after me. What do you want in life? I want the Bush administration to. So they sent a clear message. And after me, not nobody said anything other than I want the Bush administration out of office. So it's I, like the it's message that out a while. I told it before. It should come before having goals, aspirations, hard work, anything. Your number one lot in life is to be a loyal Democrat. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's what Mao said. Everything must be political. Everything is political. Poli politics is must now. be in, in, in entertainment, in arts, in everything. You can't escape it. That was the cultural revolution. Um, and that's our cultural revolution is, is politicizing everything. You can't watch a freaking Disney movie without, you know, some political message. Oh, it's horrible. And I... Uh, it's uh, I've had to like nick so many of these like movie channels off of my YouTube playlist because they'll start raging about like people who call out the woke stuff. Oh, they're mad that it's the black person. What does that What does that even mean? The movie was woke. So I've been I've been working my ass on the, off on this the last week. I'm doing like my own little study of analyzing uh, every woke movie and then showing sort of the alternative of movies with like what they would call diverse people in them that are not woke and why they're not like things like death proof or something like that. Right. So I'm sorry, right. sort of doing a whole thing. What makes something, what, what makes a movie or something woke? I know I took my, my son is six and we took him to, um, I don't remember what movie it was. It was one of the Marvel movies and the girl in it's like my mom's and everyone's like, Woo! And my, my, my son's like, why are they clapping? I'm like, cause they're idiots. <laughs> yes. That is what, that's what I really think, you know, it's, I, that's what I think parents need to do. I always say, especially with the gender ideology, with the sexualization, with all the alphabet shit, I always say, I'm like, parents need to warn their kids about this shit the same way they would warn them about not getting into a car with someone, not getting in the van when someone offers them candy. Right, right. Well, what if the van has one of those safe space stickers on it? It does! Then you, it you know. Does. <laughs> I had this great meme I made and it's like showing, it's like a stranger danger picture. Yeah. It's a stranger danger picture from like the, the 80s or something. This guy's like holding out candy, like get in my car, little girl. And I put like a safe space sticker on there. I'm like, hey kid, he's got the sticker. Come back. Get in his trunk. I mean, really what's happening now? Uh wait, I want to go back to some of the super chats. I'm sorry, I've not forgotten about you lovely people. Um Oh, I just noticed this billboard. Chris has been targeted by a lot of the feminists. Oh, they are insufferable. I was getting angry messages from the feminists last night over a joke. They're like, I am unfollowing you today. They always announce their departure. It's yeah, so I know. It's, uh, not to make it sound like it's only the feminists, even though, you know, a little bit. But I just find it funny, these people. So I made a joke about uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's vagina candle. They were very <laughs> upset about she sells it. It's on sale now for $75. It was a hundred dollars. It's on sale for 75. I said, just save money, open up a can of tuna fish, light a match, save money. <laughs> so people are like misogynist, uh, sexist. And it's these people who it's, it's like they're, there's some kind of cognitive dissonance because they're, they're kind of based on certain issues, but not others. And so I, I always wonder, I'm like, why is it that you're okay with me roasting the shit out of gay people, out of the transes, 
out of left out of every group but when it but when it comes to your sacred group then suddenly that's not funny right right yeah it's it's their sacred cow I, you know i want to know too like do these people like they get the gwyneth paltrow vagina candle like you know if you're gonna do that i want you to get the danny devito balls candle like you know be oh. fair be equal is that a great idea merch idea merch idea danny devito's <laughs> balls like you know, I think I think you have found the merch, the first <laughs> piece of merch for my channel, the Danny DeVito. Awesome! I love that. I love that. You're gonna get sued in like three weeks from like the Danny DeVito, like cease and desist. <laughs> I love it. This is this is when you come out here. So I've been watching you all week on all these like serious intellectual channels. So uh, welcome to the gutter, baby. <laughs> yeah, I have to like I have to like keep it like in, you know, like that's what my my wife says. She's like, don't be yourself like when you're out. Like just like keep that like in a box and you know, but no, yourself is awesome. <laughs> uh, I want to get to Poetry Painters Super Chat. Also, send us your super chats. As I said, proceeds go to the Mike Moving to Florida Foundation. Um, the trans activists say that Nazis were about stopping big trans because they destroyed some university of sexual swiffin or something. What was that universe? It sounds like a Jeopardy question. Yeah, I I have no idea. Um, I don't know about that. Columbia. I, yeah, I I do know that for example, like kind of like transvestite culture became kind of like a a, uh, a phenomenon in especially Berlin. Um, but I don't know very specifically, like, how trans, like, if, you know, what, look, when you look back at history, like, sometimes you, you don't want to, like, drop too many parallels because it was a unique time and a unique period. But, um, you know, there, there were certain things. I'm going to have to look into that, like, read more about that. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, that's something I'm not super familiar with. Um, sorry, one sec. I feel like I missed a super chat somewhere along the way. Here we go. Giorgio Quattrocento, who, by the way, I saw your chat before. I mean, I already knew this, but Frank might not have known that you are a fake phony fraud. He is not Italian. That's okay. Oh. We love you. Wait, Giorgio. No, I, I'm actually a wizard. I'm like conjuring like... Uh... No, no, I meant Giorgio Quattrocento isn't, but you're not either. You, you're an honor. I thought we were talking about the hands thing. I was getting like, I thought we were talking about, oh, yeah. No, you're no. an honorary one. I'm like zero percent. I'm zero percent Italian. I've done the DNA test. No, you're an honorary. You gesture enough, right. too. And you give and you give zero fucks, too. So that's like honorary <laughs> Italian. Awesome. Uh, what ridiculous thing will they do next in schools? I hate it, but I thought nude body painting for body positivity class. I, I would be surprised if that isn't happening already. I will bet you we could Google that and that's happening somewhere. It's going to be something too. It's going to, be, you know what actually it's going to be? It's going to be a teacher like putting like, like a nude of them in class or something like some like, some like 300 pound like literature teacher, like doing like an artsy thing. And it's going to be about, it's going to cause a big controversy. And then all of a sudden they're going to have like, you know, like nude books of like teachers in their class and it's going to be incursed. I mean, that's that's crazy. But again, who knows a year from now, two years from now, I thought I thought I thought drag queens reading to children or like dancing, like doing striptease in front of children would be crazy. But here we are. And that's not even the worst of it. That's not nearly that the worst it. of it, even. I mean, imagine that, 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 that that's not the worst of it. I know. And my issue with that, uh, even worse, I think, maybe or at least, you know, I mean, I don't know, but as bad as the sexualization is I feel like the whole drag queen story time, it's it's a delivery system for an entire ideology. It's the gateway into the cults. Well, what you know what I've never understood is like who like I want to walk me through the thought process. Like you're a man putting on a bra and putting on women's panties, and I'm like, I really want to go read to some kids today. Like <sighs> where does that come from? Like, that's like the last thing I'm like, you know, if I'm doing this, I'm that thinking about I'm probably thinking about like, yeah, I'm going to go out on the street. I'm going to like, you know, meet a nice sugar daddy and be like, you know, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I am not thinking about reading to children. I'm thinking about like turning some tricks on the street, but like, <laughs> these people are weird, man. These people are really tricks weird. Tricks on the street, sugar daddies, Danny DeVito's balls. This is what, this is what people come on my channel for. I love it. This is, yeah. Yeah. This is great. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
No, it will. And, it, and also, it's how many times has it happened now that these drag queens with the drag queen story time are then revealed as being pedophiles and predators? And the reason for that is because once you say the magic words, once you put the letters on the LGBT, XYZ, LMNOP, semicolon, ampersand, exclamation point, conversation over. Right. You yeah. Can't do and it's, 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 the, it's the can't plus do that. that really worries me. The plus is what scares me. Like, what the hell is the plus? Like, you can't even define it yet. It's like coming soon. The the Q is what just the Q enrages the Q. me yeah. because because it it shows how ill can it shows how no thought has, at all has been put into this from not only the people who push it but the ones who believe in it. That if you think about it, the word queer. Just look at the dictionary definition. It means every single thing that was ever used against gay people. And so <laughs> these people are so dumb that they got themselves. It wasn't the Westboro Baptist Church who got gay people to go, oh, yes, we're actually mentally disturbed and inferior and abnormal. They did it to themselves. I feel like this is like a psyop by the Westboro Baptist Church. Like they got really smart. Like, we want we want to destroy the LGBT movement. Let's add a bunch of letters. Let's like get inside and like just destroy it from the inside because you, that's what they've done. Oh, I'm so I'm so over all the alphabet shit. I'm like I I don't ever want to hear another word about any of these people. Especially, I just tortured myself and watched that movie Bros the other night. So oh god. I can't do it. video coming soon, y'all. <laughs> Some uh, heavy drugs for that. Oh, it was. Oh my god, it was horrible. Um, Giorgio asks, "It was the. Would you like to pronounce that, Frank? <laughs> Let me try. Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft. Institute for Sexual Science Wissenschaft. Uh, I was fine. Okay, so this is really interesting. I, I I don't know a whole lot about this, but now I, I want to. That. I want to learn about. It. Like I'm going to go back and look at this. Thank you, Giorgio. That's uh, that's really Giorgio cool. Giorgio Quattrocento. That does, I got to look into that. Sexual no, no, shaft sounds obscene. Wow. It does. It sounds, you know, look, it sounds very like the Institute for Sexual Science, but like in my head, I'm like imagining like it's just like drag queens, like transvestites, like doing like, you know, burlesque shows for like professors and there's kids there. I mean, that's probably what it was, you know. Or more Hitlery, like Hitlery more drag. Hit, more Hitlery, right, right. Speaking, speaking of Hitlery, I was watching the producers the other night. That could never happen now because I'm uh, I'm doing I have like a whole segment on that in my uh, whole thing about analyzing woke movies. Like that is the ultimate non woke movie. I don't know if you ever I saw think, it. Okay, but. So, no, I haven't. When when was it made? I know there's been like different variations of it, right? Yeah, I mean, it, you could really apply it to any of them, but the musical one is particularly because they go after every group of people. And it's wonderful. And it brings people together. Like I grew, my dad is Jewish. I grew up watching it with my dad. We saw it on Broadway and we're crying laughing at springtime <laughs> for Hitler. And so I feel like that's a good example of how things like that, you joke with people that you're comfortable with. It brings people together. So the fact that we can't say anything, can't joke about anything, I think is very deliberate to separate people. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know it's humor is a great kind of, um, way to break tension and to bring people together and kind of expose ourselves and our vulnerabilities and make us comfortable talking about them. And that's, I think, why they go after it. Humor is like their uh, kryptonite. It, it weakens them because it, it, it's a mockery of, of everything. Like, you know, it, you know, humor mocks them and they're kind of, it's they, they, they're phony religion. Um, it's like, you again, why, you know, you go into a church, like typically humor is not allowed in church because it, it's like sacrosanct and, you know, you're not supposed to go up there and tell jokes. It's supposed to be holy and sacrosanct. And uh, it's the same with the woke, like humor is not allowed. I got, I got kicked out of Sunday school as a kid for laughing and asking too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> you're not supposed to laugh and you're not supposed to ask too many questions, like the right questions. 
Oh my god, Frank, this is what we have to talk about. So I mentioned this to you earlier. This is what we have to talk about, though. So I knew I could count on you to know about this. Nobody ever knows what I'm talking oh, about. Okay, except okay, for, I like, anyone that I went to school with who remembers. But I guarantee you, you guys in the chat, I guarantee you nobody's heard of this. Uh, we need to talk about the Day of Silence. Uh-huh. Because speaking of laughing, like, it just... I was just picking up like a whole new relevance to it with you saying that because you're not allowed to laugh at their religions. You're but not. So it's what I is the day of silence? The, the, <laughs> it's the day when the, the girl with purple hair in your classroom comes to school with duct tape on her mouth. And you're like, what the hell is going on? No. For the game. supposed to, for the game. It's you're supposed to, it's like a day of like you're not supposed to talk because which gays are renowned for. Right. <laughs> because something about, like, murder or death or violence. Oh, is it murder and death now? They didn't have that talking point yet. No, that was it. It was like, or it was like, you know, like, they're, you know, the, the persecution, the murder of trans activists. Of course. It's all trans now. It was about the gays back then. We don't back get then it was, you're right. Back then it was like suicide. It was like gay suicide and stuff, wasn't it? Or... I don't, maybe it was suicide, you're right, but it was, yeah, it was like a gay thing. So for you guys who don't know what I'm talking about, you participated, Tina. I thought we would have been friends in school. <laughs> um, so yeah, so for you guys who don't know what we're talking about, the day of silence, it's this whole thing about like, everyone has to be silent for the whole day. Put tape over yeah. the nose, be totally silent because something having to do with the gays, the silence that they're in the closet, the silence. Every fucking year I was getting in trouble with that goddamn day of silence. I would be the first person to start cracking up laughing and talking, and they would get so pissed off. I remember very early in my teaching career, like, you know, being kind of like, you know, left and like trying to be woke. I was like taking it seriously and stuff. And then like, it, then a few years into it, everyone was like coming out like during that. Like half the girls are like, I'm gay. I'm gay. Everyone's like, I'm gay. Yeah, and I'm like, you're poor. no, you're not. <laughs> you want gay? attention and you're chubby. Right. That's yeah. basically it. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was like, that's now the, you know, like high schoolers who like aren't having sex. Like, well, it's because I'm gay, you know, in which yeah. case like half of married men are probably gay too. So <laughs> <laughs> they, it, it's so funny though. It's so, it's exactly what you just said. You can't let, they would get so furious when I would, be loud because like first of all there's nothing funnier than silence there's nothing more uncomfortable than silence and the entire idea of it is just so ridiculous but yeah they would get they would get so pissed yeah, off silence yeah if you didn't and now it's, it's now it's like you know a holy day i mean you know you have teachers teachers doing the day of silence i'm not kidding you <laughs> teachers are actually doing the day of silence like and they're like you know i mean look that's just an excuse not to fucking teach. Let's be honest. Like these teachers are going in there. They're like, you know, I'll give them a worksheet or something. I'll put on a movie and I don't have to talk about it. It's such bullshit. Uh, <laughs> Lime Lady, why do these colored hair leftist bitches always ruin these those <laughs> colors for the rest of us? Excuse me, it is hair of color. It's like oh, yeah. her and Tina. I it's, not, it's not pink. It's not purple. <laughs> no, her and Tina... Or like the the they're carrying the banner for keeping cool based colored hair alive. I was with them for so many years, but this is like the longest I've seen my natural hair color. I feel like uh, gay men should it should be a law that they can't bleach their hair after thirty. They can't bleach their hair after it's thirty. <laughs> you know what we got to do with the day of silence. I'm a big believer in using the left's own tools and mechanisms to destroy the left. We have to make this about culturally appropriating deaf culture. I mean, that's it. Like, and, and really sincere, like, how how dare you? Like, you I are using you. your privilege. You have your privilege to speak. When's the day of silence? Are, we're doing this. Oh my God, we're doing, we're doing this. We're so doing that. When's yeah, the day that. of silence? <laughs> it's in spring sometime. When, oh, perfect. It's going to be, okay. We have to, everybody remember this. Somebody make a note of this. When that day of silence happens, we're going to make a thing of that. That's like the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, oh, God. I forgot also about the little like class elections. I voted for Clinton in first grade. Can you imagine what they must be doing with that now? 
those little oh, faux elections in classes. Oh, yeah. Kind of like the damn oh, Inquisition. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It, I'm sure, you know, I don't know. I never did those. I always like hate. I always felt it was like kind of a, a virtue signaling event because the kids always want to tell who they voted for. And then it was kind of like puts pressure on the kids because, you know, the leftist or liberal candidate always wins. So I never did that. But um, schools would do it and they'd announce it. They didn't do that at your school? They didn't do like the no. fake election? I mean, New York, they probably figured it's like <laughs> a given. The, the fake election, as opposed yeah, the to the fake election. real fake election. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't vote correctly, little Billy. <laughs> Detention. <laughs> that, that's basically what's happening now every day in schools. You know what I wanted to ask you about, Frank? So I was wondering what your thoughts are on this. I have no, I'm, I'm honestly not uh, informed enough on this issue to have an opinion. But so I always thought that school choice was what we wanted was the good alternative, but I have a bunch of friends, like uh, Deb Philman, for example, is like very against it. And now I'm hearing that school choice is a bad thing. So where do you stand on that? Look, I think there's a, is school choice going to fix everything? Of course not. Is wokeness still going to infiltrate? Of course it is. However, it's, the way I look at it is it's a step in a direction that weakens the government monopoly on education. So you've got two things that are dangerous. Like, yes, wokeness is dangerous. Wokeness with like a government monopoly of like an education channel, which everyone goes through, is, in my opinion, a lot more dangerous than school choice with even half the schools are woke and half the schools are not. Because at least you've got like, you've then got some people not going through the same channels. So if someone were to ask me, like, you know, are you going to take a position against and like, no, because it's it's better than nothing if, you know, and I think we have to be like realistic and pragmatic. And I, I you know, I, I look at this kind of like with, you know, I used to be consider myself more libertarian. And one of my issues with libertarians, we all have flaws. Like, yeah, they're, they're, they're still like part of them that like I, I totally get. And it's like it's a part of like, you know, it was part of my transformation you know, the, the stage where you like wear a fedora and you're like, taxation is theft. But <laughs> they always made like perfect to the enemy of good. Yes. And, and that's what I kind of worry about with this situation, that we're going to like get so caught up in this, we're going to like go nowhere, do nothing. We're still going to have like public education exists the way it is because we were fighting about like the perfect solution. So I think it's it's better than nothing. And, and until there's like a really viable pathway that can become mainstream. Um, you know, I, I, I'm like, I'm cool with it. Um, you know, I don't want, again, like what, what like, you know, Corey DeAngelis is doing, like, you know, people can, can make certain criticisms because of positions he's taken. But at the end of the day, like he's doing a lot to weaken government schooling, which is where so much of the indoctrination occurs. I'm like, okay, like I, you know, we, we have to be politically pragmatic and we have to be politically smart about how we do things because we, at the end of the day, look, we have to win elections. We have to have policy reforms. Like we, you know, and there's, there's some degree of like, we can, I don't want to say like that any of these people are virtue signaling, but we can make ourselves feel really good by saying things that feel really good to say and like feel ideologically pure and feel like really true to ourselves. But like, what's the outcome? Like, have we affected anything? That's that's been kind of my uh, my evolution, I would say, politically, even as a conservative, has been to like try to be more pragmatic. Like I want to win elections. Like I I hate continuing to lose and being like, you know, well, well, I voted for the libertarian candidate, like, and which I have in the past, and I'm like, I felt really cool at the time, but like now I'm like, damn it, I just want to win. Like I just want to do something weak in these leftist fucks. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I think it, there's no arguing with the fact. I think at this point that the only way forward for any sort of independent ideas are through the two parties and infiltrate them. You know, the radical left has taken over the entire Democratic Party in a way, I think, for the better. That's what Trump did with the Republican Party, although the old one is still trying to cling on for power. Um, 
so yeah, I, I don't understand, especially with the libertarians, like their hero is Ron Paul, but he understood that the way to accomplish this is to run within the two parties. So I, exactly. I, uh, and the Republican party has always been a big tent party. And, and our biggest threat is immediate in the near term is like us becoming fractured. And so anytime I see conservatives start to like become fractured and fight over these things, I'm like, guys, like, this is how we lose. This is what the, the left wants. Nothing more than this. And so sometimes you just got to like, like suck it up. Like you're going to have to make some concessions because conservatives, one of the great things about us is we're, we actually like are very diverse in opinion. We've got like, you know, religious conservatives, we have fiscal conservatives, we have like libertarian types, we have, you know, like uh, people like me that are some weird outliers. Um, and and to keep them on, kind of to keep us all kind of together and like on the same goal, we have to identify like what's really important and like, you know, go along with it. And, um, and you know, look, like with Donald Trump, like, the religious right had to do that too. The, the guy's been divorced a few times. He's not, as, they're kind of like, Okay, but like, you know, I'm going to have to make some concessions. And so we all have to make those concessions if we're going to win. Oh. That's very well said. I, uh, yeah, that's one thing that's been driving me crazy lately is that I feel like at a certain point over the last year or two, so many of them just all started going after each other. Like, for example, this thing that's this big story now with uh, Steven Crowder and the Daily Wire. I'm like, I don't care. I don't give a shit about any of this. You people feel like, right. it's just so stupid. It's like, and, and I, I've seen things sort of coming out of a bunch of different people of like, it feels like some of them don't understand that the way to win it, uh, coalition is a beautiful word and that's what we need to be not everybody has to be a uh, traditional conservative not everyone has to be like us not you know but we need to come together for what matters our constitutional rights our liberties or there's going to be none left exactly exactly and i think too you know being whatever being a whether you're kind of like a you know conservative micro influencer or you're like a big mega conservative influencer you can't like you have to keep your eye on like what's important. Like you're not like, don't let your ego get in there. And that's what this, this Crowder and Shapiro thing has become. It's like, it's a big, just ego match now. It's yeah. totally nothing to do with conservatism, nothing to do with, you know, our, our future. It, it's about two powerful personalities. And like, that's, that's another risk, um, you know, to kind of our collective kind of uh, conservative future is, these kind of popularity wars that are undergoing as everyone competes for space at the end of the day, like, you know, Crowder losing and Ben Shapiro winning or Ben Shapiro losing and Crowder winning are, it's a loss either way. Like we, we yeah. need both of them to win. And uh, I get, yeah. I don't know who, like, who's to blame and who's I, I, like you said, I don't care. I'm like, <laughs> both of you guys like, like, come on, like, uh, well, and I feel like the underlying argument that uh, at the essence of it is, uh, should they work, should they try to create a new sort of system online or work within the existing one? The answer is yes. All of it. Do all of it. It's all needed. It's all necessary. I feel like we kind of basically need to be like the super friends. We all have different skills. We all have different strengths. We all do different things. But I think that's what's needed to, because it is already such an incredibly uphill battle if you consider the power that the left has in every single entity and every single institution in this country. It's already such an uphill battle that we just don't have time for this shit, which is why it drives me crazy. Yeah, there's definitely like, you know, some like gatekeeping. They want to keep certain people like influential in the like the, you know, kind of conservative influencer establishment. I mean, I've had this like where, you know, there've been events and like people I know, like have been involved with them and stuff. And, and they'll be like, you know, we're going to bring someone on to talk about what's going on in public schools. And they're like, Professor Emeritus, like of educational policy, Dr. Hubert, like Zimmerstein. Oh, He's like, I I will talk about yeah. and I'm like, here, I like Paul Rossi. I mean, Paul was a private school, whatever, but like Tony Kinnett and myself, but we're like, okay, I guess we'll watch from the audience. Like, you know, it's just like one of those things where like we need to get people um, 
in the right positions, but there is some like gatekeeping. They want to like, they've got their little popularity clubs and they've got their influencer clubs and they've got, there's money in it. Like we got to be on, you know, this thing, but daily wire uh, versus Crowder, it was about money, but um, it's, it's doing a lot of damage when, when these, when these fights happen. And, and when we also don't like to a degree, put our egos aside and like bring other people into this. Like I, I can't tell you how many other teachers I've tried to like, Hey guys, here's this teacher, like put him in this. I've never thought like, Oh, this person's going to be like a threat to my like position as the teacher who took this stance. Like, I'm just like, look, we need more teachers out there just countering the narrative. And, yes. um, because you know, the, you win the popularity battle for how long until, you know, we're all in, uh, FEMA camps and and they're they're making us watch this and it's like right before our execution, like we're gonna have to defend everything we've ever said. Like, oh, and I'm fucked. <laughs> yeah, I know we're t- totally screwed. We're we were the smart guys that decided to put it all online and record. <laughs> like, you were the smart guy. I don't know what I was. I was like the. <laughs> <weird one. laughs> um, I was trying to find. Um, this is I. Uh, beloved friend Saskillen asked this before that I wanted to come back to it question when did history civics classes get eclipsed by social studies and why um I think you saw in the 1960s um you know when there was kind of a, a radical shift in American culture you started to see following that a lot of radicals started to move into education um, and start to, I mean, look at like Howard uh, Zinn, his people's history of the United States. Um, By the way, that was my history textbook. That was right. Exactly. So they, the, the left started realizing like, we need to get, we need to start winning the wars of the future by starting with the minds of the young. And so let's like get involved, like let's get involved in, their educational processes. And um, you have like, look at Bill Ayers. He was like, a, he was a, he's a terrorist. He was at the Weather Underground. He's like teaching education uh, at University of Illinois, Chicago. I mean, they they made a decision to go in education for a reason. They're not stupid people. They knew it was a, a pathway to victory. Um, so I don't know if I can pinpoint exactly, but I think that there's definitely a trend from the 1960s to politicize education. Yeah. Um, so that they could, you know, create a demographic shift for society. I think that's exactly what happened. Dylan hit the nail on that. They aren't teachers, they're re-education tyrants. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I, I'm not going to disagree with a lot of these people. I mean, it's, you you have kind of a, a, a sacred position as like a, a civil servant, and you have an incredible amount of power. You know, you have 120, 130 kids under you every year. And you are the kind of master authority. They will listen to, they will believe most of what you say um, as teacher on your subject. And to take that and kind of abuse that power and ensure your personal politics is the ultimate like civic perversion. I mean, it's it's like, you know, what, what treason is to, you know, the, the military, it's like the education version of treason, I guess. That That's makes well sense. Said. I, it, and it's so, you know, sometimes people ask me, which, which is weird that anyone would ask me this. Like I'm the last fucking person that should be giving anyone advice on like their kids. However, I feel like this one thing I may be correct in is like I said before, I feel like parents don't have the luxury of just standing back and ignoring it. I feel like they kind of need to like proactively warn talk to their kids about it warn them and be like these are the things you're going to be told these are the pressures you're going to be faced with even just even uh like maybe this may be like a year or two ago i was dating this guy who had like taken a couple years off uh from college and he was starting and he was starting back and he was going to some like liberal arts school and i said to him probably a hundred times jokingly don't let them turn you trans and he's like haha that's so funny so, you know, uh, stuff ended quite quickly with that relationship. However, within like two or three months, guess what happened? No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. That's, uh, so it's, and, and those are, and that's with 
grown adults. So imagine with little kids. I mean, there was just a study that came out showing the astronomical increase in kids identifying as, you know, they always say as LGBTQ, but it's not L, it's not G, it's it's all gender ideology shit. And, and I think yeah. the reason that I find this personally so insidious is because I know for an absolute fact that I would have been what the prototype of the person that this would have been pushed on when I was a teenager or whatever, because I had a weird style and I was back then I was like, I love David Bowie and Rocky Horror and stuff like that, that I was like, oh, I just, I just want to be like an alien. And so that it would have been a trans or a they them in the making. Yeah, yeah. I It's funny. I have a friend um, and she's she's gay and she said the same thing to me. She's like, I would have been like a prime target, like kind of a, a tomboyish girl who was like gay and who was insecure about her like identity and she's like i am so glad this wasn't in school she's like because i would have like had a double mastectomy and been like you know tom uh 10 years later and um yeah yeah it, it, stuff. It, it would i think with that with that stuff above anything it, it just blows my mind how we're allowing this to happen how people are how anyone could be okay with that and, and that's sort of, you know, how there are these certain questions you can ask them that you will never get an answer to. You can ask them to your blue in the face for the rest of your life. You will never get an answer. But when they try to come at me with, oh, it's about rights and equal rights, I always ask them, I'm like, okay, at what age does a little girl have the right to a double mastectomy? Never get an answer. <laughs> the fact that you have to even ask that question is just like... <laughs> They're going to have an answer to it at some point. They're going to like. They're going to like make it very scientific. They're going to be like, nine yeah. They're like, well, it's six and three quarters. <laughs> well, you you might see. I mean, kind of like you know the the French had the Declaration of the Rights of Man. I I would. There's been like, I, I know that there's been buzz in like certain like far left circles about like a Declaration of Rights of Children to like consent to all these different things. Um, yep. Like to be able to like, you know, like children should be able to consent to like sex and be able to consent to like, um, like divorcing their parents, like at a certain age, like being able to legally separate like this. Another I know it sounds, right. It sounds far fetched now, but it's coming. And like, don't get me wrong. Like no. children do <laughs> like children are not their the prop. Like I agree. Children are not property of their parents. You can't like whip your child like every night and be like, well, he's mine, but they're going to take that. And they're going to stretch it to all these other things. It, it's already happening. Um, you have, you know, I mean, you have like all of these people on TikTok and stuff uh, the, uh, with millions of followers speaking to young children, telling them to disconnect from their families, cut them like that scumbag Jeffrey Marsh. Who, who is that? Jeffrey Marsh. I didn't see that. You don't know Jeffrey Mar. Oh, I, I've done some impressions of him that I'm working on my uh, next one. I, just, I feel like I tried it with some of these crazy people. Oh, he's he's a, he's a they them. Um, and but his his big thing is telling children he want I, I I want to talk to the kids. He he I love talking to the kids. Um, and his big thing is that your parents are evil. Go no contact with them cut them off. They're abusive. And, and it's, it's oh, the language is always so deliberate that it's never, if you were abused, it's never, if you, it's, you are, you are. There's going to be, I imagine a dystopian future where families are like around, like watching TV and they're going to be like, now parents, please leave the room so we can talk to the children. And the parents are going to think that's going to be the future. That's literally what he does. That's literally what he does. He had a video. <laughs> this is one of them that I did like a recreate. So with some of them, I'll, uh, I'll kind of just repeat verbatim what they're saying, but try to like, uh, and I mean them in, as in multiple people I've done, not that I'm calling that skeevy man a they. Yeah, they um, <laughs> but but uh, I'll, so I'll try, I'll basically just repeat verbatim, but kind of flip it in a different context, like sort of take the polish off of it so people can maybe see a little bit clearer how sick these words are when you, you know, just say them in a different way. But um, so anyway, though, uh, one of the things that he did, he was like, uh, OK, parents, uh, leave the room and give the phone over to the young kids. 
And so I did this video, like uh, a recreation of it. And so my dad watched it and he said to me, he's like, that guy, he's like, nobody actually does that though, right? Like there aren't parents who are like actually doing that. And I was like, oh no, of course not. But I thought about it. So I looked on, uh, I went on TikTok and you know how you can see like the people who, like the basically quote tweet, whatever it's called on TikTok thousands there were thousands sure. of parents who made videos and okay kids here watch uh aunt jeffrey with like toddlers oh it's yeah i mean you know like what's going on in their mind like oh, okay internet stranger um i'm gonna leave the room like you know i mean what happened to like stranger danger remember like the days of america online they're like you know winnie hey, the pooh you know? winnie the pooh he knew what that bitch knew what was up. Did you ever see that <laughs> Winnie the Pooh singing about not okay touching? No, I didn't. What? <laughs> I think my parents, I, I forget if it was a school or my parents, somebody maybe watched it. There was this like, video of like, uh, it was called Too Smart for Strangers, where Winnie the Pooh sang a song to Piglet about not getting molested. I like, you know, of course I laughed my ass off at the time, but looking back, I'm like, I think that was a very positive thing. And I don't see that ever being taught to kids nowadays. No, now it's going to be Winnie the Pooh's like, going to be like, oh, no matter what fluff you have inside, you can be whatever you want. <laughs> like, that's good. Yeah. Oh, it's so sick. It's so sick. Um, the, al turn. the alphabet community now and trying to pronounce the LGBT Bahama. I think of that classic Sesame Street song. I don't know what that oh. is. Oh my god, mm -hmm. I get the point of that. That's true, Leah. I'm thinking of like the one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. Is that is that it? You know when they used to sing the numbers, they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That's how effective Sesame Street is at like brainwashing you. I still remember like the so so you think about like I remember those patterns now, like what kind of weird stuff you get on there. I won't let my watch kid, kid watch that Sesame Street. See, not, I got, I got, I got it from 1995. He can watch like <laughs> the 80s <ones. laughs> I, I got lucky, I think, that um, my dad took me to like some work thing with him and the guy, one of the, like the main people from Sesame Street was there and I met him and he had this big disgusting mole on his face. So I was terrified of watching Sesame Street because of that mole. So I never got brainwashed by Sesame Maybe that's why, maybe that's why I know what's up now because I wasn't brainwashed by Sesame there's Street. There's like there's like a really good like Sesame Street has this like very narrow band where it's like not too progressive, but it's like just the about like you know they're like, but and then there's like ones like from the early 70s, they're like, hey, here's like a black doctor. Black people can be doctors too. And everyone's like, ooh, wow, progressive. Like, I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I let my kid watch that. And then you get to like a certain like time period and it's just it gets weird. You, uh, I was going to say this a second ago when you were like, what is that with these? It's, oh, it's always women, of course, that they're the ones handing the phone to the kids to watch uh, Aunt Jeffrey. I, I think it's basically luxury beliefs. I think that's what it comes down to for these people, yeah, that it's yeah. a status symbol. It's, ooh, how exotic. Look how progressive we are. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. No, I and agree. It, it's to sit at that table because they were probably fat and dumpy in high school and no one liked them. So now as adults, they want to sit at the right uh, cafeteria table. It's all in-group, out-group mentality. They want to be part of the in-group. And this is the way to do it, to show your submission to all of these ridiculous things. Yeah, it's so, and it's like, I just can't imagine like who, would, like that these people are so desperate and so hungry for like social validation that they'll like, sacrifice their kids at that altar like i know that's, that's that as a parent that's just like you know we'll i mean be, look be, no parent's perfect we all like you know like you you give your kid the ipad because you, you didn't feel like taking a, like some time off parenting for the day like okay we get that but like then then there's a the whole other level of like i'm gonna like really risk fucking my kid up because i get to tell my friends at like you know racquetball club about like getting to watch like queer Elmo, like talk to them about transing themselves or I don't know. Fisting. 
yeah. <laughs> Muppet fish. Well, I mean, all the Muppet Muppets are like, you know, you get your hand up. Oh, and they're into that. Cause they, yep. oh, I never thought yep. of that. Yep. Every Muppet has a hand up inside. <laughs> Maybe. Or no, they used the sticks. Jim Henson used the sticks, I think. It was all downhill from there, though. Right. right. Adam, uh, don't let anyone stick their fingers in your honey pot, Piglet. <laughs> uh, Winnie the Two Spirit Poo. Winnie the Two Spirit Poo. Uh, Giorgio Quattrocento, there's a meme called the No No Square. No, no, don't touch me there. This is my No No Square. I don't know what that is. What? That's like Winnie the Pooh's yeah, song. That's great stuff. Yeah. No. No, no, don't. Ooh, I, did, um, I just realized I missed a super chat from before. Sorry, Sunspot. Uh, play the woke agenda against them. Being against the death penalty is white supremacy. Two white gay guys get away with harming their adopted kids. Oh, oh yeah, that, that, that case in, uh, oh, yeah, the Florida one. Was that I, look, I don't know the details of what happened before, how these monsters were ever able to get kids maybe there weren't warning signs i would think there possibly were but it, but it's exactly what i was saying that once you say the magic words lgbtq xyz elemental p conversation over no questioning no background check yeah. no nothing conversation it's, over. it's funny you know talking about like privilege i was like they never would have gotten away with it for that long if they hadn't been wearing those rainbow shirts yes I'm sorry, like that, that allowed, because people automatically saw them. They didn't want to ask the questions um, that need to be answered because they didn't, because it, you know, may have been uncomfortable and it, but yeah. It, it, well, it's exactly like with, uh, you know, all of the, these drag queens that were doing the story hour that were, you know, then found out to be, uh, many of them were convicted pedophiles who were on the sex offender registry. There was nothing uh, about they never should have gotten a toe in the door but it's because you can't do a background check you can't ask questions about who will be working around children because magic words yeah um well anyway i don't want to keep you all night even though we could talk forever so if anyone has any last remaining super chats send them in frank what are you working on currently well, we're, we're just kind of like, you know, working on this um, local organization. M my hope is to kind of develop a, we, we've got kind of this cool team. We've got like, you know, me, like a former teacher, I'm serving as the executive director. And then we've got um, a political strategist who actually uh, managed, I, I won't say, I don't know if he wants me to say who, but one of the, uh, in the Illinois governor's race, one of the uh, uh, big kind of uh, front runners, um, he managed their campaign. So we've got him like working on the political strategy part. We got like a bunch of different people with unique positions. So what we're trying to do is we looked at like, um, or I, I should say, I was kind of looking at like these, all these different like local parental groups, both in Illinois and just across the country that I've met with. And like, they had all this great energy and like passion, but you'd ask them like, what what, are you, what have you done? Like, what have, what have you accomplished? And they're like, well, we, we got this book like out of our schools. And I'm like, that's probably not enough. So we're kind of like, it's great. But like at the end of the day, I mean, you know, what we really need to like turn the tides is like really big change. So we're, we're kind of trying to use like our community as, as, um, as, as kind of like the, I don't want to say testing ground, but in some ways it kind of is like, we've got these issues in our schools, like many, people do. And we're like, let's, let's, you know, using kind of our diverse skill set, find out like what, what is actually a viable political victory look like? And, and how do we achieve that? And so like, we're, we're trying out like, you know, using comm strategies, like, you know, using like email chain list, um, you know, with a program called nation builder using um, political mailers, seeing if we can like move the needle a little bit that way. And um you know, gain some influence over the school board, maybe eventually gain some like political power and be able to like run our own candidates. And if, if it's a big, if we can find like a successful strategy, you know, we could put this in kind of like, make like a handbook, like, you know, and get this out to people. Like, this is how you actually really win some real political victories at, at, at the school district level at the school board, because that's what we need. Like we look, I, I love the energy of like going to the school board meetings and be like, look at the porn they're reading to my kids. Like that was the first step. But now we got to like, yeah. now we got to win and we got to do it fast. So that's what I'm up to. 
Frank, you're amazing. I'm so glad to know you. I, you. I'm you so proud. Of that. That. You know, I'm going to show her this part. You should tell my wife that. I'm going to show her this. Like when you say, you know. <laughs> she knows it. She married say, hey, you, know, you know, Mike, Mike thinks I'm amazing. And tell, you know, say, we'll edit this out. I want you to say like, you're really great at like keeping the house clean. And like, you know, you're always on top of like the dishes and stuff. Score me some points here, Mike. Just, just if, she, you know, if she's, a, I, I'm available for mistressing anytime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not now though. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, everybody, Great. thanks so much for having me. I really had a lot of fun. Yes, you got to come back anytime you want, and anything like I'm, I'm, you're doing such amazing stuff, truly. Thanks, thanks, appreciate uh, it. Well, yeah, that was a lot of fun, and uh, you have a great audience, too. Uh, I'm still reading some of your comments. I saw a lesbian couple who also abused their kids. And, okay, well, well, I'll read these <laughs> later. <laughs> you set that up like it was going to be some like funny remark, and you're like, and the kids got I just it. read it like off like the cuff, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm reading. I completely agree. You're awesome, Frank. We loved seeing you. Oh, God. I need to stop freaking balls. Uh, great guest. Hell yes, he is. Um, If you guys are watching and you have made it this far, what should be like, what is the hashtag of the episode? Send it to us. What should it be? Chat, tell us. What is the hashtag of the day? They always come up with something insane. <laughs> I've got one. <laughs> what? I was going to say Danny DeVito's balls. Danny DeVito's balls can't. Something that's like with Danny DeVito's balls can't. I was like, that's... <laughs> Danny DeVito's ball. Was it balls or ball candle? I don't know. Ball candle. Something like that is uh, the counter ball to the Dennis counter. Hashtag ball candle. If you guys are yeah. watching and you have made it this far, send us hashtag ball candle. <laughs> um, so I Take should say a couple little things. Um, so I'm going to be making a ton more videos. It's my goal for the, it is my 2023 goal because I've been so, we were talking about this. For, like I've been so um, inconsistent with making things. So it is my 2023 goal to go full time with making content. So I have a bunch of cool videos coming out, like some funny ones, some serious ones, a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, I, it's sucked a bit that like I keep getting thrown off. Like my dad got sick, my dog got sick, I got sick. So all the sickness is done with for the year, hopefully. So uh, if anyone watching this, now in the future feels like supporting my stuff so I can upgrade all my shit. Uh, subscribe to my locals, my Patreon. We're going to be doing more Zoom hangouts on locals. We're doing movie night soon. We're going to watch this movie, Karen. Have you seen this like woke horror I've, I've, movie? I've heard about it. Yeah. I'm going to have to tune in for that. You got to come on one time. We do like a okay, uh, yeah. theater kind of thing. <laughs> I completely agree with you. Thank you, Leah. Sydney Prescott or nothing. Pay Nev Campbell. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that. <laughs> um, you guys, I cannot emphasize this enough. Follow this man. He is horribly shadow banned and suppressed. It's awful. The links are below. Support all the amazing work he is doing. He is a real motherfucker. There are a lot, there are a lot of full shit people out there. This is a real <laughs> motherfucker right here. Thanks, Mike. And send us hashtag ball candle. Frank, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. That was a blast. All right. Love you guys.